You know, Jesus suffered, died on the cross. So it wasn't a big sacrifice, but some of you, you slept in and had bacon for breakfast. I can smell it on you right now. You know, my grandson, he's two. His name is Sam. He loves bacon. And you, when I go to breakfast on Sunday morning, I always buy him a piece and leave it back there. So they send me pictures of him sitting back there going, he's two. Sitting, he, he, he used to not be able to say the N. He'd call it bacon with an M, you know. He, he's cute. Cutest grandkid ever walk the face of the earth. And his sister's Paisley. Just like all you crazy grandparents. I understand now. Wow, y'all looking good today. God bless you. It's Resurrection Sunday. He is risen. He's alive. You know, he really, really is alive. Uh, and, 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 you know, there's hope in that. And uh, you don't have to have fear in that. It's wonderful. I wasn't sure who to have preach today. I was thinking about this for a few weeks, you know, and you, some of you have heard me say this. I don't love to preach. I love the pastor, but I, I don't love preaching. I, I don't, it's just not, you know, I don't know why I don't love it. I just don't love it. You know, I do it. It's kind of like every, every job has things you don't like. You got to do it, you know. So, and that, you usually hear pastors say, boy, I tell you, this ministry would be good if it wasn't for the, the pastoring part. I like to preach. That's all I like to do, you know. But I was thinking about it, and I thought, well, you know, maybe, you know, out of pity, I should have the ugliest pastor preach this morning. But then I thought, no, Austin, he might say something weird or something. So I, I, didn't, I didn't ask him. My son, you know, he's my son. And, uh, and then I thought, well, maybe I'll have the pretty pastor, beautiful, the good-looking one, you know. But, you know, I thought, well, Luke, he, you know, he's just young. He probably flop, you know. Easter Sunday morning, get up here and just flop, you know. Just not that experienced. And so then I thought, well, how about the funny guy, the crazy, wild, funny one? And I thought, no, Zach, you know, tell him what he'll say. He'll say something so off the wall, and no tell him the old people will like go, Pastor, what were you thinking? That guy's a nut. So then I thought to myself, I know I'll have that silver tongue guy who is dresses like he done went and walked out of a GQ magazine and everything with his little shower. I have him preach, and I thought, no, they won't listen. They'll just look at him. And then, and then I thought to myself, I'll have somebody that's really deep in theology. You know, he knows the word deep in that whole Bible stuff. And I thought, oh, Gary, he'll be boring if he goes all of that deep stuff. Everybody, whoosh, on Sunday. So then I, I thought to myself, well, I'm all of that stuff, so I'll just preach. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll just preach it. I'll just do it myself. And so take that however you want to. You got me, whether you like it or not. There, that's the end of it. Hey, I want to say a thank you to John Merriam. John, I don't know if you're here or not because I can't see you, but if you are, wave at me or stand up. Are you here, John? Is John in here? Stand up, John. There's John. John is my friend. Let me tell you about him. I have, he used to be over here at All Pro. Now he's got his own business, J&K Automotive on Douglas. And John is my friend. He's honest. And I've sent a lot of business to him because he ne doesn't take a care. He doesn't take advantage of single women or anything. He's always the same. He doesn't gouge people. He's a great mechanic, John. And so listen, and, and, and you know, I'm just saying this. So we've developed a friendship over the years. I have a high respect for him. And uh, he called me up a couple, few weeks ago, and he said, Pastor, I got this vehicle. I was going to sell it. It's a used one, but it's a nice one. Is there a good family in your church that could be blessed by it because you would know them? And I said, well, I think there probably is. Let me think about it and get back to you. And so I did, and today that, that van out under the canopy, he's donating that to one of our families, and I want to say thank you, John. Let's thank John, and God bless you. Thank you so much. And, and, it, and if you're listening live today online or any other point, go to J&K Automotive if you don't want to get ripped off. And uh, <laughs> we do have a person in our church that, that also works on cars. It's awesome. Our electric guitar pay, player here, he's really good as well. Okay, guys, uh, today I titled the message, I Will Rise. I Will Rise. You know, uh, it's kind of an odd, odd person I'm going to talk about. You're going to think, now, why on Easter Sunday on Resurrection Day, are you going to go talking about Job? Well, the reason is, is because we got a lot of trouble in this world. Did y'all know that? I mean, 
be yeah, uh, uh, people. Uh, Jesus said in the last days, people's hearts are going to start failing them for fear because there's going to be a lot of trouble. And the Bible describes the last days. And, and uh, you know, you're thinking about North Korea and that wacko over there. Yeah, I called you a wacko. And, uh, and then we got Russia. We got Syria. We got... Uh, Iraq and Iran, and not everybody, though these places are bad, that's not what I'm saying, but some of the governments, and you've got ISIS, you've got murderous ways, you've got fear of nuclear war, of chemical warfare, and fear just abounds. I mean, people are scared. But you know, I'm not. You know why I'm not? Because I know the last chapter. I know what happens. Right? Because Jesus lives, we too shall live. He is alive, he rose from the dead, and I will rise when he calls my name. There'll be no more sorrow, no more pain. In Revelation, it says all death, there'll be no more parting, no more death, no more pain, no more sorrow, nothing else. It's going to be victory. And there was a man named Job that knew this by the Spirit. He walked so close to God that God even boasted to Satan about, have you considered my servant who is upright in all of his ways? And he made prophetically Predicting, predicting ahead, he said, I know that my Redeemer lives and upon the earth in the last days upon the earth he shall stand. And he said, even, and he went through horrible times, he said, even if my flesh fail me, my, my flesh eaten by the worms, he says, I know that with my own eyes, in my own body, that I'm going to see him someday. He is alive. And he was saying, I'm going to rise too. You, and he said, he said to, uh, to God, he, to his his friends who were telling him that all these troubles you got on you is because of your sin, he said, let me tell you something. He said, even if God slays me, I will hope in him. Even if God kills me, the worst case scenario, even if he kills me, I will always trust in him. I will always hope in him. I will not and never quit hoping in him. And James mentions it. And I think Job is a is a lesson for us to never give up, to not believe the lies of the devil. The devil started with lies. He always lies. He's the liar. He's the father of all lies. The Bible says he's roaming around seeking whom he may devour, going around the world and to, to resist him. Do not believe him. Don't listen to that voice. He'll say you can't be pardoned. Your sin is too great. He'll tell you you've blown it beyond measure. He'll try to get you to lose your faith. The Bible says Satan comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. What's he going to steal? Your faith. He's going to kill you and destroy you for eternity. He doesn't want you to believe in God. He lies about God. He says God doesn't care about you. God is not good. There is no God. What you keep praying to him and things don't change. There is no God. Curse God and die. And that's what he does. And so Job, who didn't do that, Job, who persevered through his trouble, Job, who stayed true, Job, who kept his integrity, is an example for us that I want to encourage you with because Job knew there was a resurrection day. And Job knew the Redeemer lives. And Job knew that he would see God face to face someday. And he said in James chapter 5, verse 7, Be patient, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. You see that? The Lord's coming is near. Be patient. Stand firm. Don't back off. The, Lord, the troubled times will come in the last days. Don't back off. The Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you'll be judged. The judge is standing at the door. As God is gracious, be gracious. As God is forgiving, be forgiving. As God is loving, love. Brothers, verse 10, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, even if you're suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance. Had a, you have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. And that's not there by accident. James knew the book of Job. It's not there by accident. Because that's what Job kept saying all the way through his troubles. That the Lord was gracious. The Lord was good. The Lord blessed him. And this is what I want, why I'm talking about Job. 
<clears throat> he asked the question, if a man dies, will he live again? And his emphatic answer, Job answered it himself, absolutely yes, he will live again. And I want you to know, I come a little bit emotional today when I wear my fancy shirt with the little cuffs like this. These are my father's gold with rubies cufflinks here. I, I miss my dad terrible. Some of you have missed people. I think, I think of the Nicholson family who's got big holes in their hearts. And some of you who've lost your children, lost spouses, lost brothers or sisters and grandparents, a huge hole. But let me tell you something. There's no more parting there. The resurrection of Jesus Christ means we too shall rise. And those people that are in the graves by faith, they're going to come and someday I'm going to put my arms around my daddy and hug his neck and tell him I love him. I'm going to feel that hand once more that I can imagine. I have touched it many, many times. I feel it. My son's got my daddy's hands, and I'll come to him sometime, and I'll take his hands, and I'll feel Austin's hands, and I can feel my father in those hands. It's the weirdest thing, genetics, somehow. But that's, that's the hope that we have. That's the confidence that we have because Jesus is alive. And let me tell you something. Don't you let the world tell you this is a fairy tale. We got a picture right here from Israel. We were just there. <clears throat> it's a picture of a tomb. And uh, excuse me, is Steve not here? This is where the picture goes. Where is it? <laughs> okay. Is it not there? It's not firing. You know that computers are demon possessed. <laughs> the devil is a liar and he's a thief. And he's a computer messer-upper. <laughs> Lay your hands on that, Tammy, and rebuke the devil out of it. Say, in the name of Jesus, come out. Well, it'll come up in a second. <clears throat> a picture of a stone that's rolled away, and there's a tomb. We'll get it in a minute. If it doesn't fire, just take a gun and shoot it. And, uh, <clears throat> and th it's, it, this is not like a photo someone made up. This is right on the road, and Tammy took the picture. And it's literally a round stone rolled away from the from there. I went, we went to a place where Jesus was buried. It's not a it, if he was buried. We think he might be buried. No, it's an absolute sure. Dr. Wade Nunley says this is for sure. We know from writings. We know from archaeology. We know from a lot of things. First century tomb. It's right there. They built the holy site. They built a church over the top of it. And there were hundreds and hundreds of people in line. It were taking us hours to wait in line to go and to see that spot where he was buried and where he rose from. Only about Two or three hundred feet away was the, the, where we went and we looked exactly on the hill of Golgotha where he was crucified, where they put him on the cross. And the Bible says in straightway they laid him in the tomb. They brought him over and laid him there. Right next to it, because we didn't want to wait in line, is another first century tomb exactly like the one Jesus was laid in. Exactly. And, he, and, 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 and we went inside there and we looked around and it's like, this is real. See, this isn't a fairy tale. And if you... If you think, if you have any doubts, let me tell you something. People that say there is no resurrection, people that say Jesus did not rise from the dead, see, people that think it's a story that's a real tomb right on the road, right there. See that? See that? We don't just make up some story about a round stone and a tomb. This is the way they did it. It's exactly true to history. And everything in that book, when you go there and you walk the land, you know it's true. And listen, people are ignorant if they think it's not true. You don't even need the Bible to know it's true. We've got ancient literature documenting this stuff. Even the people that hated him and called him a blasphemer said, we know that he rose from the dead. There is no doubt. But he did it when he was a boy in Egypt where he learned that magic. Written ancient literature, that's what they say. In other words, they confirmed, even though they were against Jesus, that he, he rose from the dead. He appeared to 500 people at once. His disciples that were all fearful and took off and scattered suddenly were bold because they knew because he rose they were going to rise and they were no longer afraid of death. And you don't have to be afraid of it. You don't have to be afraid of nuclear stuff. You don't need to be afraid of economic collapse. You don't need to be afraid of weather that's coming and whatever. The worst thing that could happen is you get killed, you could die, you could get sick, you could suffer a little bit. Hey, you're going to rise again. I will rise when he calls my name. That's what this resurrection means. It means that. So, hey, don't be fearful, okay? 114 times Job asked questions. I mean, he went through a lot of trouble. He asked a lot of questions. Uh, Paul, he says in, in Corinthians, 
Paul the Apostle, he says that uh, if there's no resurrection from the dead, then we're the most miserable people ever there could be. We have... We don't have, if in this life we have hope in Christ and that's it, there's no afterlife, we're, all, we're miserable. But now, is, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become, he is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For by man came death. Since by man, the first Adam came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead, Jesus, the Son of God. For as in Adam, Adam and Eve, all die. Death comes to us because of sin. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. And he goes on and he says, Death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Death, hell, and the grave. We have the victory over that, and we don't have to live in any fear. If you'll take your Bible and turn to Job, the Old Testament book is in the books of the po poetry books in the Old Testament, right before Psalms. And if you go there, I want to just kind of outline with you just a little bit what the book has to say. In chapters 1 through 5, God says how godly and amazing Job is and how wealthy he was and how all of his children. And he commends him. In chapter 6, all of a sudden angels come along with Satan with them into heaven. And God says, where have you come from? And Satan said, from roaming through the earth, going back and forth in it. Why does he roam through the earth? Because he wants to steal your faith. He's roaring, seeking whom he may devour. That's why. He's, he's doing it here. He's always doing it. He's a liar. And then he said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He's blameless. He's upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And Job says, does, does he fear God for nothing? I mean, after all, you bless him with everything. You're so good to him. Why wouldn't he serve you? He said, he said, very well then, go on down there and do what you want. Just don't touch his body. Do what you want. So he comes, and within a short period of time, in verses 6 to 12, we see that, that he has this conversation with God, and then Satan goes down in verse 13 all the way through verse 19 of Job chapter 1. Job loses everything. Satan takes it all. He loses everything but his wife and his life. His own life and his wife. She's the only thing left. And look what he says, this amazing statement. At this point, when he had lost everything, his sons and daughters were all killed. The wind came, blew, blew the house down. It wasn't the three little pigs. It's a real story. They all died. Boom. All of his servants died. All of his animals were killed. Everything was gone. And Job got up and tore his robe. He shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground, and he worshiped. Boy, when you have all that happen, you're going to worship God. He still believed God. And he says this. What a statement of faith. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And I want to tell you something. That's a statement of faith right there. He knew God was good, and God is loving, and God is gracious. And in verse 22, it says, In all of this, all these bad things that happened to him, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Job did not sin. And then in chapter 2, he wouldn't sin. He wouldn't curse God. He's trying to get him to curse God. In chapter 2, Satan comes again to heaven. He says, well, the, he's, he says, Job keeps his maintain, his, uh, that he fears God and he shuns evil and he still maintains his integrity even though you've taken everything from him. He says, you let me touch his flesh and I'll guarantee you he'll curse you, God. God says, very well, try it. So he goes down and the Bible records and it says, verse 7, Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and he afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet, sores to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and began to scrape himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, here's why God didn't take his wife, because she was a curse to him. Well, read it. I know, I meant it to be funny, but it's true. His wife said to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, you're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not, and not trouble? Now there's a statement of faith. You're talking about a fully devoted man of God? Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And then the last of that verse, in all this Job did not send him what he said. And then in chapter 3, his friends come. And, and basic in the conversation, they keep telling him, what a rotten sinner. You must have some secret sin. There's something wrong with you, Job. God doesn't deal with men like that. You got problems. He said, blaming him, pointing the finger at him, putting him down. But he didn't sin. 
He did not sin. And Job says in chapter uh, 14, I don't know, I don't know if I did Job 13, 15. Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. I will surely defend my ways to his face. In Job 14, 1 and 2, he says, Mortals born of woman. He says, a few are a few days and full of trouble. They spring up like flowers and wither away like fleeting shadows. They do not endure. In other words, life is short and trouble is sure. Jesus said, In this world you will have trouble. Be of good cheer and overcome the world. The rapture is not a get out of trouble free event. I'm going to tell you something. You're going to go through some things. And plus, this world's already gone through horrible things. Plus, right now, Christians in other countries are being shot. Their kids are being tortured in front of them. There's horrible things happen. They've already been bombing these churches in, in uh, where was that last year, last week? Was it Egypt or Greece or where was that? I forget. In Egypt. Killing Christians everywhere. It's a temporary, this body's temporary, but Job understood that life is more than just a body, that we are soul and spirit, and we are eternal, and we're going to have a new body, and it will never die. In Job chapter 14, verse 14 to 17, Job asked a question, if someone dies, will they live again? Will they live again? All the days of my hard service, I will wait for my renewal to come. And here he speaks of the trumpet call. You will call, and I will answer you. You will call and I will answer. You will long for the creature your hands have made. Surely then you will count my steps but not treat track of my sins. See how he talks about the grace and mercy of God, the forgiveness? You will count my steps but not keep track of my sin. My offenses will be sealed up in a bag. You will cover over my sin. Because God is new. He was gracious. He was merciful. And he knew that God would call. He would call him and he would answer. And he would be with God forever. He believed he would live again. You see, Job's tears did not obscure his sight. He let his tears magnify his sight, which helped him to look ahead at what God had in store for him. And even in his pain and his suffering, Job, Job confessed his belief in the goodness of God, that God was good all the time. The temptation, number one, Satan's temptation was for Job to curse God. Like I said, even his wife encouraged it. Curse God and die. He had lost everything. He asked 114 questions, yes. He complained. There's nothing wrong with asking questions and not understanding, but when you don't understand, you can still trust God's heart. He lost everything, but again in Job 122 and several other times throughout that book, it, all, it says of Job that in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. See, his, he was, uh, he was a, uh, a man that was real. It's only on television where you can come to God and never have a problem and get all the money you want and everything else. And so if you'll send your hundred, uh, God will give you a thousand. Baloney. He will not. The crooked evangelist will take your hundred dollars and you'll be just a hundred dollars poor. It's not how it works. You don't give to get. You give to bless. You give to glorify. You give to worship. It's okay to question God and to be honest with God, but God doesn't always answer. It was later in chapter 38, finally begin to, God begins to answer, and he asked, asked Job a bunch of questions of his own. But Job never cursed God, never did. In Job 2, 7 to 10, it says this, Job 2, verse 7, Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. He afflicted Job with painful sores from the sole of his feet to the crown of his head. And I know I'm rereading it on purpose. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. I tell you what, women, don't do that. That's a bad thing to say. He replied, you're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from, from God and not trouble? And all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Again, no sin, no sin. There was temptation, but he overcame it. In the pain and suffering, he, God, Satan will whisper. He'll say, where was God? God doesn't hear you. God doesn't love you. God doesn't care about you. God hasn't forgiven you. You're doomed for hell, and that's all there is. That is not our God. Our God is a loving God who gave his only son that he would go to the cross in your place and pay the death for your sin, for my sin, where I wouldn't have to die, I wouldn't have to suffer, but that he would take it upon himself because he loved me. And I will tell you, I'd much rather die than give my son. But God the Father gave Jesus the son, and that's how much he loves you. You see, the next thing we see is the testimony, the testimony of Job. Job was in the fight of his life. He wasn't fighting against the Lord. He was fighting against Satan's relentless attack. And if you're a servant of God, you're in a battle too. 
Satan wants to make your life miserable. Now, I, I'm not a huge fan of professional boxing, but in the 70s, there was some amazing boxing going on. I'm telling you, that Frazier, Joe, smoking Joe Frazier and a Muhammad Ali in the 70s, their first fight was in 1971. Frazier knocked Ali flat out, code out, knocked him out. They fought again in 1973 as a rematch. And after 12 hard rounds of fighting, Ali was named the champ by points, and he won that. Now the big big test was up. Ali and Frazier met on October 1975 for the best out of two out of three. It's called the Thriller in Manila. Ali considered himself a poet, and he was quite boastful. And he would get up and say, he would boast, God, be, he'd be a, uh, this, this is going to be a killer, a chiller, a thriller when I get to Gorilla in Manila. That's what he would say. And for 12 rounds, Fraser, he pounded Ali into submission. I mean, he was beating the tar out of him. And everybody thought he's going to get knocked out again, Ali. But, 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 and, 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 but in the 13th round, suddenly things changed. And Ali began to jab, jab, jab with the left hand. Frazier nine times, whack, 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 and then he came across with a right hook. He hit Ali, and that mouthpiece come flying out of his head, and he stunned him. And from that point on, he took all the punch out of out of of out of uh, Frazier, and Ali began to make 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 more and more points. And then in the in the 14th round, that was in the that was in the 13th round. In the 14th round, Frazier just kind of was in a daze. He just kind of out there, and he went over in the corner. And his trainer stopped the fight, and Ali was crowned the champion. It looked like Ali was out, but, he, but he, when, when the bell came, he couldn't go out. In the 13th round, he knocked him out. To me, that's a lot of what happened to Job, just like that. That's what happened to Job. For 12 chapters, Satan pounded and pummeled Job. Job had been knocked down numerous times. Pow! Job lost his fortune. Bam! Job lost his friends, and his friends accused him of great sin. Boom! He lost his family. Boom! Job's wife told him to, to, to give it up and curse God. And, and Satan was just pounding away on Job. And you can just imagine heaven just sickened as they would look down at their beloved Job. And after 12 rounds, Job was bruised and bleeding, and the spectators, the angels of heaven, must have hidden their faces as, as they were looking upon this. The ugly bully Satan, the, darkness, the prince of darkness and evil, the father of lies, who I can't stand with anything within me. He's horrible, and uh, he is your enemy. He's a formidable, formidable foe in this evil prince of darkness. But then in the 13th chapter, out of nowhere, Job, he suddenly slips an uppercut. Boom! He hits Satan right up under, squarely up under the jaw, and it knocked him, knocked him back, and he began to wobble. And boom, he went down, and Satan got him. And what was his punch? I'll tell you what it was. It was his testimony when he said, Though he slay me, yet will I serve him. Though he kill me, yet will I serve him. And that statement of faith, that hope, fully devoted statement, that fully devoted statement is what I'm asking you to make today. No matter come what may, whether I understand it or not, like Job of old, I'm saying, though he slay me still will I serve him. I will hope in him. And after 12 rounds of viciously being pounded, Job, uh, uh, Satan was suddenly hit with this verbal upcut. And he stopped in his tracks with a look of unbelief in his wicked eyes. He wobbled and fell knocked out cold. And the angels of heaven erupted with cheers as Job stood there with gloves raised, ready to repel any more blows of, fallen, of the fallen foe of Satan. Job was victorious, but it wasn't until chapter 42 from that point on that Satan was finally knocked out and beaten for good. The knockout punch was delivered. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. You see, the devil's chief tool is to lie to discourage, to cause trouble. And then when people hurt you, people blame God because that's the voice of the enemy. When your spouse leaves you, that's God's fault. If somebody dies and gets sick because there's disease in the world, that's God's fault. Anything that doesn't happen, it's always God's fault because that's what Satan whispers. Hey, God, he's no good. He doesn't love you. He doesn't care. And he wants you to forget God, to curse God, turn from God. And you know what? Even religious leaders that are stupid, do stupid things. Satan whispers, says, see, there's nothing to that. Baloney, we're all men and we're all women. We all fail. We all sin. God is gracious to all of us. I don't care what position you hold. So we see the temptation. We see the testimony. And finally, we see the hope, the resurrection. Is there life after death? He said, absolutely. People want to know what will happen to me after I die. Everybody has an opinion. An atheist claims death to the end of human existence. After death, there's nothing. Buddhists claim a person to be reincarnated, reincarnated as another type of animal. 
And, and this is one of the few questions Job asks and then gives an immediate answer. And he says, in Job 14, 14 to 15, in the days of my hard, he says, yes, I'm going to rise. All the days of my hard service, I will wait for my renewal to come. You will call, and I will answer you. I will rise when you call my name. He's going to call, folks. Are you ready? You know, for your sins to be forgiven, you just have to simply ask Jesus to come in your heart. He changes your heart. You know, people want to live their own life. They don't want to be bothered with religion. They don't want to be bothered with all that. But Jesus himself, his own words said, if you keep your life on earth, you'll lose it in the end. But if you give your life to God's will, you'll find life everlasting in the end. And he comes because you can't do it with the strength of pulling up your boots and being good enough. Us, Jesus didn't need to die on the cross. And you, you have to come just calling on Jesus, just asking him, you know what? His spirit comes in and he gives you a supernatural power. That resurrection power the, that raised Jesus from the dead, the Bible says will raise you up to new life. And old things will pass away and suddenly your heart will be changed. That's what grace does. It changes your heart. It strengthens you. It gives you a supernatural ability. Jesus said in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and I am life. He who believes in me will live even though they die. I'm telling you, you can live forever. Here's what hope does for you, folks. It remembers that suffering is only temporary. If you bow your head with me, perhaps you've lost a loved one, suffered a divorce, your parents are split up, maybe you're confused, maybe you got lost a job, you're, you're hurt, you're depressed. You're dealing with the same temptation Job faced to curse God and die. You feel like shaking your fist at God. Why are you allowing these terrible things? It's exactly how Job felt. But like all temptation, we can resist it, and it's going to get better. God's going to be with us. And Job knew. He said, Job said, that God knows the way that I take, and when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. He understood that God was a, a refiner, that the fiery trials that come on earth burn away the impurities in our lives. And then our life is left, as James says, like pure gold. We're mature, complete. Job wasn't afraid to die. Are you? He wasn't afraid because he said, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end, that God, my Redeemer, will stand on the earth. And for as me, he says, after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. And if you're here this morning and you need Jesus to forgive your sin, maybe you're not sure if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven. He will give you that promise. It's called peace, the peace with God. It's called no fear of dying because we know where our home is. You come to fully devoted to Jesus, and he'll give you life everlasting. If you're not ready to meet God, would you respond today? If you don't have that peace with God this morning, or you're living in sin, God will forgive you. He'll change your heart supernaturally by his spirit. Just ask him into your heart to change you. And turn toward Jesus to begin to follow him and turn away from your sinful life. He'll give you life. And if you're here and trouble has got you down, you're discouraged, you're a believer, you're following Jesus, and you want to declare with Job, though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. I know the end. The resurrection of Jesus makes the end sure that I will rise when he calls my name.